Welcome to this bonus episode of the Misophonia Podcast. So about 10 years ago, the New York Times published an article called When a Chomp or a Slurp is a Trigger for Outrage. That article was probably the first really mainstream article about misophonia. And it comes up in conversations time and again as the article that really validated the condition for people with misophonia and for friends and loved ones because it's the article they could share and say, see, it's even in the New York Times. I was able to catch up with the author of that article, Joyce Cohen, and she was very kind enough to spend some time with me talking about that article and some others she's written, and also just her thoughts in general about misophonia. Now, a couple of notes. The audio is a little weird just because I was recording the phone call from a regular microphone, And so it has that phone quality sound to it. Also, you could probably tell I'm a little nervous talking to a Times writer, let alone the author of an article that changed a lot of misophony lives. Also should warn you that the topic of suicide does come up, particularly because one of her other articles does deal with a tragedy involving someone taking their own life. Now I'll have all the links to Joyce's articles in the show notes, but for now, I hope you enjoy this bonus conversation with Joyce Cohen. Thanks for taking the time. This doesn't have to be too long, but uh, I think um, it just, you know, I've talked to like over 100 people now on the podcast and, you know, your article just comes up a lot, um, as I'm sure, you know, that's, you've probably heard from other folks. Um, But yeah, I just wanted to hear a little bit about kind of maybe like, how did, like, how how did you get the idea for, for, for that article? You must have known about it, uh, or had you experienced it uh, as well? Um, I'm curious, kind of. How, you, how, how that came about. <laughs> oh, wait, back up one second. Yeah. You had said, like, a lot of people mentioned my story. Mm-hmm. So what, what have you heard? Like, what have they said? I mean, it was the first mainstream piece. It was the first piece in a mainstream yep. publication. Yeah, it just, it comes up. It's a funny, serious attention. Yeah, so what happens is, I mean, in that, what, what usually, what's so common, as, as you probably know, is, like, you know, people suffer with this since, you know, around preteen years, and then they go into adulthood. Um, at some point, you know, whenever around around ten years ago is when a lot of people a lot of people just got better at googling, and people just start googling, and the, you know the New York Times article because of because, largely because of you know SEO these days, um, it just comes up near the top, and and uh, what happens when people first realize that Miss Funny is a name, they just start reading everything about it. They don't sometimes they don't even sleep. It's just such a revelation, and uh, you know your article is just one of the common ones that uh, that explains it like. Um, like at a kind of a uh, to a lay person, just kind of in a in a very approachable way, and so um, and you know everyone everyone is trying to uh, give it some legitimacy, so they like to all, um, often quote that hey the New York Times is talking about it. Like I read the article in the New York Times. It's the, usually the one that they pass to family members or partners to kind of get people to take it seriously. So um, that's that's one reason it's kind of propagated because it gets shared around a lot as well. Um, um, and you know, you know, I wrote a piece about Michelle Lamarche Marais who killed herself, right? I, I was, I just, I have that on my screen right now. Yeah, I didn't know about that uh, until I was doing a little bit of research for this. So, yeah, I was going to ask about that as well. That's, that's, I, I probably heard about that, but that's crazy. I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't forgot about that until now. Do you have misophonia yourself? I, I thought I saw an ABC News um, video piece about a Joyce Coin in New York, and I wasn't sure if that was you or not. Was that you? Who... That was me. That was me, but I do not have misophonia. Everyone thinks I have misophonia. Okay. I do not have misophonia. Okay. So they were talking about hyperacusis. So do you have hyperacusis? Yeah, so okay. my interest in it is because I had a noise injury, and mm. misophonia and hyperacusis are always confused. Right. I get why they're confused, and they sort of, sort of in, in some cases, come under the category of, the umbrella category of decreased sound tolerance. So this is an umbrella category that has set the field back by decades. It does not help anybody. They're right. completely different things. And if you describe them, there are sort of similarities to people who don't know about them, and so they've been conflated, and they're different. But no, I do not have this funny. Okay, okay, gotcha. All right. Um, so then, um, when you wrote, so yeah, when you wrote the article, what was... Um, you know what? What led you? To write, did some? Did New York Times assign that to you, or was that something you came up with yourself and wanted to share it? I fought for a year and a half to get that into the paper. Oh wow! So you know, the internet ten years ago 
years ago. The story came out 10 years ago on the day after Labor Day, 2011. And I fought for a year and a half to get it into the paper. The internet was still kind of new then, or at least it's had a lot of transformations in the last 10 years. And yeah. so on hypercusis message boards, there was a huge amount of confusion. And people would mention they had misophonia or they had whatever symptoms they had, and it wasn't hyperacusis, but nobody got it right. So I thought this deserved a piece, and there wasn't anything in any mainstream publication. I knew I needed to get misophonia in a credible mainstream publication to give it legitimacy. And I fought for a year and a half to get it in, and the science editor said, well, there doesn't have to be any real science on it, but you need like a real scientist to indicate that this is real and this is true, and this isn't made up. And so Adi Muller from the University of Texas was... He was key there, and he has written a lot about auditory disorders and chronic pain, and he was sort of instrumental in in talking about misophonia and being quoted. So, I, oh yes, I said I fought for a year and a half to get it in the paper, and then at one point, there's a book I think called Annoyed or Annoying or something, they were doing a review of this book, uh-huh. and most of the stuff in the book was about noise. Like, people being annoyed by noise. Yeah. So they didn't want to run my story too close to the publication of the review of this book. So they postponed it for another however many months. <laughs> so finally, a year and a half later, it ran. Gotcha. Okay. And, and did you start to get a lot of reaction right away? Like, were people like, oh, my God. Or was it kind of a, more of a slow burn? The New York Times had some kind of agreement with the Today Show that they had, I forget, it was four stories per month or something, where the Today Show had, like, the right of first refusal ah. and a story on it, and this came up instantly. Yeah. And so the Today Show was interested, so it ran on the Today Show, it was the following week, it was on the Today Show, and... Um, so yeah, it took off. It took off immediately. And that was the that was the interview where in the green room there were there was character. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was. I was in the green room with Heidi Salerno, and they had snacks, and I took a, a carrot or a baby carrot, and then I was horrified. I, I didn't realize it until afterwards. I was absolutely horrified that I'd done this in front of Heidi. But yeah, I was in the green room, and they had Ada Siganoff, who was, she was in California, her piece was taped, and then they had Heidi on live, and I was in the green room in the background, and they had Dr. Raj, Dr. Roshni Rajapaksa, who was the doctor, talking about it, and of course she'd never heard of it, so I prepped her, I had like two minutes before they went on air, when, and she'd read my piece, when I, you know, and in those two minutes I, I you know, talked to her all about misophonia, and she was terrific. So wait, so they had a so they they got a doctor for the show who didn't know about Miss Funny other than your article, and then you coached her for two minutes, and that was uh, and and, and yeah. they put her on the show. Yeah, I mean, they had, wow, she's a medical expert, Dr. Okay. Raj, she's a gastroenterologist, <laughs> and she was sort of the medical expert. That would be amazing if there turned out to be a link between gastroenterology <laughs> and, and uh, Miss Funny in the future. Not, but right. she took it. Um, she took it very seriously. The worst thing she said, though, she just said, like, you know, this is, it's very unknown, and research is going on, and we're learning more every day. Well, we're not learning more every day. No, we're not. We're not learning enough. And, yeah, there's there's now a, I mean, there's now a fund, the Milken Institute. I don't know if you heard about that, but in the last couple of years, they've been... Yes. Yeah, so yeah been, they've, they're funding, or, I mean, I'm not quite sure what's going on with them now, but they were funding... They're, they're funding this funny research and pouring a lot of money into it, or, or that was the plan. Yeah, they, they and they have been. This is, I think, the second year, and I think they're, I think they're continuing to to um, do requests for projects and are funding projects every year. Um, I was just talking to Dr. Rosenthal at Duke about it, and he's like, "Yeah, I mean, he's they're getting funding from there, and he's seeing that the funding go out to a lot of groups. So, um, so that's pretty new, just in the last couple of years, and looks to be something that they're um, that they're." Uh, uh, continuing, so that's quite promising. Um, that definitely wasn't around ten years ago. Um. Right, right. It, it completely wasn't. I mean, ten years ago, I'm sure people were considered. It was like a laughing stock. You were laughing stock if you complained about something so stupid. Right, right, exactly. In, in fact, the suffering is just unfathomable. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, well, and, and speaking of suffering, do you want to do you want to talk about that other article you wrote? Um, I guess it was was it in twenty sixteen that the tragedy with the woman in, on the east side. So Michelle Lawrence, who is a 
Walmart Marat had a posting in one of the Facebook miscellaneous groups, which I occasionally look at. And it was just clear to me that she was like smarter than anybody and suffering so much. And she had actually contacted me to ask some questions because she had written, well, she read my, my time story. And so I hadn't been in touch with her for about a year. I was thinking of her. And I saw the headline. And the headline was, historian, well, no, the headline was, it was just something like, expert in Russian history had, had killed herself. And as soon as I saw that, I knew. Oh. Because her field of study was Russian history. Yeah. And. I mean, some of the things later on said she was Russian. She wasn't Russian. She was American. She was from either Chicago or Miami um, or Florida. But she she had studied, and I think it's a scholar of Russian history. So she had studied Russian history and had a PhD. And, yeah, the minute I saw the headlines, I knew. It was like the perfect tabloid story, right? Yeah. So I called up the people I knew at the New York Post, and I said, I know why Michelle killed herself. So I wrote that story. I had a lot of correspondence from her and um, and a lot of information about her. So you had... I mean, she had told anyone. She had told anyone with me some of those things. Right. So you, she, she had corresponded to you. Were, were you in also responding back um, to her with, uh, I don't know, like, uh, with anything like coaching or... or no, I gave, her, I gave her what information I could. Yeah, okay. Which is, you know, I, 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 I can know about Miss Tony without being able to fix it or without being able to help. Right. So, and what happened was, she lived in a a big new condominium building on the east side, and there had been construction within the building, and I believe it was an apartment one floor below her and one unit over, so sort of like diagonally below her, or sort of kitty corner one floor below her, and they had done a renovation, and... You know, these are multiple dwellings, and all the pipes and infrastructure, all that stuff's crammed into the wall. Yeah. So if you move something or change something, it can, you know, a pipe can vibrate against another pipe, or like if the water's running, it can make something rattle. So this created some kind of background noise in her apartment, and it drove her, you know, it drove her to distraction, yeah. and she had nowhere else to go, and... Nobody took her seriously, and she had actually investigated with the people upstairs, and it wasn't the people upstairs. She, she at some point was able to identify where the mm-hmm. crime came from. Yeah, wow. But yeah, she, she killed herself. They found her. I, I don't know if she overdosed. I think she overdosed. They found her in bed with a pillow over her face. Wow. That's tragic. Yeah. Had, uh, had you know, had other people... Um, we, you know, have, have other people reached out to you before or after that, just in a similar way, maybe not, obviously not ending in such a tragic way, but, um, cause you know, a lot of people don't, as I said, don't talk to anybody about this. And, and I think when they, when they see somebody who seems to like know, as, as um, this woman did, um, um, you know, what they're going through, they might want to reach out. I'm just curious if, if you've had like a, um, a series of people over the years, uh, try to yeah. confine you. A bunch of people have emailed me, not a huge number, you know, maybe half a dozen or so. Yeah. Um, occasionally, people I know have said things, like people I know have, like someone I know has an aunt who has misophonia, and as it turns out, my neighbors across the street growing up, it seems to be inherited, and it seems to run in families, and it was father, daughter, and granddaughter. Mm, and the granddaughter had made some kind of remark on Facebook about how she hated popcorn in the movies. She hated other people eating popcorn. Yeah. And I learned from that that her mother has it and her grandfather. So when I was a child, the grandfather, well, when I was a child, the family would eat dinner around the TV. They had the TV on loudly and they'd eat dinner around the TV. And I just thought that's what they did. You know, we ate dinner around the dinner table, but they ate right. dinner around the TV. Background and noise. Now, yeah. years later, I realized this is to drown out the chewing sounds. Yeah. So, and, then, and, and yeah, I've gotten, I've gotten some correspondence after Michelle killed herself in my piece when I heard from two people who knew her and one of them was one of her grad students in England who said, 
now she goes home because she had a crappy marriage. I said, well, she may have had a crappy marriage, but people, well, I, I don't want to say that. People can kill themselves because of, of their lousy marriage, but that's right. not why she killed herself. Right. And, and it may have been she had a bad marriage because of her misophonia, because she complained so much about her husband and how he didn't understand and didn't help. Yeah, right. Was not accommodating or, or just, yeah, wasn't understanding. That could be. But, but yes, yeah, so I heard from I heard from a grad student of hers, and then I heard from another friend of hers. She apparently made a suicide attempt at some point earlier, maybe six months earlier, and the friend had called the police. The friend was was not on site. The friend was upstate and knew she was about to kill herself. Called the police, and they stopped it. But I don't have any further details about that. The friend contacted me afterwards. Right. 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 Okay, gotcha. And I guess, yeah, maybe, um, uh, I get, yeah, I don't know, fast, fast forwarding it to now. So you're not, um, so you're doing, uh, you're writing about other things now, right? Like real estate, but are, are you, uh, it seems like not, not about misophonia issues per se. I generally write about residential real estate. Right, right, right. And it, I've written a few things about misophonia. I had another piece in Stat News about misophonia. Oh, in and where? I think when, <laughs> Stat News is okay. when Quiet Please came out, when Jeffrey. Yes. When right. every Scott Goolsby's came out, yeah. I did a piece in Stat News. Gotcha. Yeah, that was a great. Uh, yeah, that was a, that was another milestone that uh, that documentary to get a lot of people into the fold or just raise awareness. And, and but it sounds like you. I mean, uh, you're writing a residential real estate, but it sounds like you're. Um, it sounds like you're still um, staying abreast of uh, hearing issues. Well, things move slowly in fields right. like this. It's not fashion where they yeah. have like you know new a, a new clothing line every. And you got in touch with uh, Dr. Johnson, I guess, for that original uh, for that original article. Um, uh, I'm curious did you did you know Dr. Johnson before? I mean, she's kind of a luminary in the field. Um, she, she's another one who kind of mentions your article as like one of the one of the milestones of uh, of, of raising awareness. Uh, other than like uh, hearing from sufferers, are you in contact with some of these with some of the researchers still uh, o- over the years? Or well, sort of, sort of sporadically. I didn't yeah. know Marcia Johnson before all this. Okay. Um, yeah. But I'm sort of sporadically in touch with them as and when I do a piece, and, yeah. or as and when I write a story. And now misophonia has sort of taken off so much; it's kind of like I gave it like launch velocity, yeah. and now it's out there in the world. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, it's 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 been great, and then uh, I'm hoping that. I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I think before my piece in the Times, people couldn't articulate the problem. It was like the problem of right. the Like they didn't know what to call it, didn't know it had name, didn't know other people had it. They thought it was just a weird quirk. Right. You know, a lot of people are annoyed by noise anyway, so this just seemed like being annoyed by noise only to a much greater degree. So it didn't necessarily seem like a real thing until. Until it was sort of articulated and, and had a name. And by the way, so my piece in the Times ran the day after Labor Day, 2011, mm-hmm. and I had actually had in there that it was also called 4S. Um, that was the old name, yeah. Selective sound sensitivity, sensitivity syndrome. syndrome. Yep, yep. Yeah, and that got cut out in the editing, and the editing was kind of rushed because it was. I, I didn't have a regular science section copy editor because of the holiday. Yeah. An editor from the National Desk. And so it, that got cut out. And so with the name for us, or selective sound sensitivity syndrome, which at that point may or may not have been soft sound sensitivity syndrome, I can't remember. That got cut out. And so misophonia got into the mainstream and into the literature because of that. And there was no sort of alternate name. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so... so we, it was, it was, yeah. I don't know what would have happened. I don't know what would have happened with the name if 4S had also been in that story and given it a, a different name that didn't sound so. I don't know if this is funny, it sounds scientific or weird or like no one knows how to pronounce it, but 4S is sort of more accessible in a lot of ways, but it never made it into the story. And I still wonder what would have happened if that had been in there. If, you're, if the science editor wasn't on a holiday for uh, Labor Day or... <laughs> if we had, yes, if we had a science copy editor and right. it has been the day, after, the day after Labor Day so that the regular science copy editor was 
it, you know, the regular science copy editor had, had been working that day. I mean, I, I don't know. I'll never know. Honestly, I think Misophonia works. I mean, I know it's less, maybe less accurate than uh, Selective Sunset and Series Syndrome, but nobody wants to see Selective Sunset and Series Syndrome. I mean, 4S, yeah, but that's kind of even more kind of cryptic. So I, th- I think, I don't know, I think I think things kind of worked out. Um, I don't know, I could argue in both directions, yeah, but yeah. we'll just never know what, what would have happened otherwise with a different name. Right, right. But it's still the same sucky thing no matter what you call it. And it's still it's here, here. unfathomable suffer, um, suffering. I mean, exactly. Michelle Morales killed herself, and right. she's not the only one. And right. I'm sure there are a lot of unidentified misophonia suicides. I mean, people, you know, people attribute it to something else, but it's not. It's misophonia. Yeah, there were suicides. Yeah, there's also, uh, you know, we wonder sometimes, like, how many crimes, like uh, assaults or, or murders, might might happen because um, because of these things? Uh, be, you know, because somebody just went a little too far. Most of us have these thoughts, but we kind of keep them completely at bay. <laughs> but uh, it's oh right, I'm sure there are many many crimes because of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. And sometimes you see in the news, you know, there's a noise dispute, someone shot someone, or someone killed someone. Right. Well, a noise dispute may or may not have been a misophonia dispute. I mean, people don't like noise. In many cases, uh, that's why right. the book, so the book about annoyance was mostly about annoyance. Right. So, what do you? Uh, I guess maybe. Uh, yeah, I'm curious. Like looking, looking, um, looking forward. Do you? Um, I don't know if you have anything coming up or have thoughts about anything uh, coming up to write about misophonia. But I'm, I'm wondering if you have uh, any ideas on what uh, advice for people who want to raise awareness, maybe write something uh, about misophonia. Like, if you have any advice for folks. Well, I don't really. There are a lot of avenues now. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff online and, and your podcast and research is going forward. So there's a lot uh, there, There's a lot more awareness than there had been and probably than there ever could be in in a different time, you know, in, in a non-internet age. Right, right. Um, and at some point, it gets repetitive. I mean, at some point, yeah. you know, everyone complains about the same thing, yeah. and there's nothing new under the sun. You know, right. they complain about chewing, and, and you know, if, if 50 people are complaining about chewing or about the dog licking its paws, but there's nothing new about that. Right. You know, they get, they get irritated or enraged when someone chews, and, you know, there aren't that many variations on that. I mean, you know what I mean? There could be. But, um, so, so at some point, you know, there's, the conversation just sort of repeats itself. Yeah. It, does, it doesn't really, it, it, there's, there's not really anything to advance the conversation. I mean, until there's a new scientific breakthrough or until there's, there's you know, something they discover, you know, more fatty myelin in the brain or, or whatever might be responsible for this, or the, the nuclear gene. Um, until they find that, I'm not quite sure what else. What else to add? Yeah, what else to add? We just, it's kind of a wait and see. Um, have, have you heard, what else? You know, what are some of the, um, I don't know if you have heard other more kind of interesting stories uh, other than Dr. Mares, uh of uh, maybe not quite to that tragic level, but have you, I don't know, have you heard some other kind of wacky, interesting stories uh, over the years of, uh, you know, from people who have suffered misophonia? I probably don't even know all the articles that maybe have written about it, but you, you might be aware of some, some uh, other yeah. stories. One thing I find is, you know, right about residential real estate, mm-hmm. and I've actually had people who had people... Wait, wait, sorry. I'm, I'm trying to, get to cough and not talk too loud all at once. Sure, sure. But I've had people that I've been discussing my real estate stories with, and they had misophonia. Ah. And, I mean, somehow it comes up in conversation. I had one woman who said, you know, at one point, she just like, really, really, really smacked at work, and she had to really apologize because one of her colleagues was, was just really getting on her nerves, and it was like the only time that it ever happened at work. And then there was someone else, it was a young couple in Brooklyn, and somehow this came up, and it was a husband who said, he was on the subway, and someone was, I don't know if someone was chewing or clipping their nails or something, and someone else was standing on the subway with him, and they sort of caught each other's eye, and they both sort of at the same time said, Misophonia. Oh. And then I was talking to uh, there's a doctor at Stanford about a completely different medical subject, and it came up, and his his wife has misophonia. His wife just like hates it when he chews, and so it, it this just comes up. And I think some people have it mildly, 
child and they don't even, like, you wouldn't necessarily know except that it comes up. Like, like with my neighbors across the street growing up, I wouldn't have known except on Facebook, the granddaughter wrote how she hated people chewing popcorn in the movies. Right. And I wouldn't have known except for that. So sometimes it comes up just sort of incidentally. You're right. It does. It does come up. It, people have a mild form, but it's usually like when you tell people like it, there's a fight or flight sensation. That's kind of when people are like, "Oh, the either light bulb clicks or they're like, or you know, they're like, oh, it's probably m- more just an annoyance. It's that fight or flight sensation that really um, um, kind of clicks with people, and they're like, yes, that kind of explains a lot of my childhood <laughs> um, and, and and later years." Well, the fact that it's hidden is a real problem. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think with any hidden condition, that's a problem. And if you can't see it or or prove it in some other way, you know, you can't do it. You, you can't figure it out with a blood test. You can't figure out with medical imaging. I mean, maybe you can if you're Dr. Kumar. Right. Or, um, you know, putting someone in some kind of a really dumb machine. But other than that, it's hidden, and I think that's just a real problem. It's a real problem because it's yeah. I mean, everyone everyone talks about how they they bottle it up, and then there's that sh- there's a shame and guilt because it's not that it's not just that they feel they f- they feel the pain, but they they feel bad for the um, because they don't. It's hard for us to at least before we knew we knew it had a name. It's hard for, it's it's hard for us to accept that um, we should be feeling this way. It's like it it pains us to kind of you know glare at our parents um, in a mean way and have them feel bad, then it makes the sufferer feel bad. And after years of that, it just kind of really weighs on people um, as kind of another yeah, and, problem. And people aren't, other people aren't doing anything wrong. I mean, right, people are right. chewing or breathing or something, they're not doing anything wrong. I mean, everyone, everyone breathes. Everyone has to breathe. They right. die if they don't breathe. Right. So um, that's another aspect. And, and it's also, I think, in many cases, inescapable. Right. Right. You mean you mean the, the misophonia as a condition uh, inescapable? Yeah. No, a, a person with misophonia is never going to be around other people who aren't breathing. Right. So right. there's right. so many circumstances under which other people can inadvertently cause a great deal of distress. Right. Right. I mean, you could close your eyes if you have a visual if you have visual triggers, but it's hard to it's hard to be completely um, yeah, turn off to listening to things. Yeah, well, Joyce, I mean, it's great to get kind of just the context as to kind of like how this all came about and, and kind of the, the backstory to kind of one of the more um, kind of uh, impactful uh, you know, articles written about misphonia and it really kind of, I mean, it honestly changed a lot of people's lives. So, uh, well, I think, I think at some point it would have come up again because a few right. years after my piece, you know, Baron Lerner wrote a piece. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, it would have come up at some point. But I happen to be the one to bring it up. Right, right. Yeah, I know, and we all, yeah, we all appreciate that. And um, yeah, and, and again, yeah, thanks for thanks for taking the time here to just kind of yeah give us give us a little background here. And I'm glad that you're uh, um, kind of still, um, yes, yeah, still uh, on you know learning what subject, even though even if it's not like a day to day thing. <laughs> but it's, uh, and hopefully, hopefully, we'll hear from you again. Uh, maybe maybe there'll be a breakthrough, and you'll you'll get you'll get to write about it. It sort of sucks that there's not really much at this point that can be done. Right. It's, uh, you know, it's all sort of coping or management, but, you know, that's the way it is. That's the reality. Yep, yep. And for your, um, I mean, just quickly, just for your, how's your, I mean, how's your hyperacusis these days? Are, have you learned kind of new ways to manage it? It's sort of, you always learn, but you never learn. Yeah. I mean, as time goes on, you get much better at managing it, but it's still more a case of having to protect yourself from injurious noise. But hyperacusis is a little bit different because a lot of healing goes on, so mm. as long as you don't re-injure yourself, I mean, it responds to noise. It responds to noise, it responds to quiet. Right. So you get better in the quiet and you get worse in the noise. Ah, uh, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, okay. So there's a bit of a back and forth there. I see, I see. Okay. Okay. Cool. Well, yeah, I, Joyce. Again, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for thanks for doing this. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll let you know when this uh, when this goes live. Of, of uh, I'm going to try to surprise it on the uh, on my followers and and whatnot. And speaking of Baron Lerner, have you spoken to him? I've not. I've not. That that'll be next on my list. I think. Yeah. Are you in touch with him by any chance? In any way? Um, I mean, I I haven't been, but if okay. I if 
if I email him, he'll answer me. Okay, I'll, 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 I can reach out to him too, but um, yeah, that would be... Um, yeah, he, 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 seems to be, he seems to be pretty mild, so I don't mm. think that... I mean, one of the things he said was he hasn't gotten worse. Uh, like, I, I think it's basically stable and has been like that for decades. Okay. So he, um, you know, he copes really, really well. Or, yeah. you know, or he isn't as severe as some people's, or... It's worsening. Yeah, a lot of people, it worsens from their 20s onwards, and then it's kind of like, uh, then they have to kind of really st- <laughs> really focus on it, and it probably plateaus because they've really uh, either, you know, made sure that they, like somebody I was talking to today has like uh, sound machines in almost every room of his house, and so um, there's somebody I was talking to today, his, uh, his main trigger is uh, neighbor's dogs, he can't seem to move to a house that doesn't have dogs around him that trigger him, so he actually has some device that he's put um, on the fence between his house and his neighbors that automatically um, emits like a that that kind of uh, anti-dog high frequency noise as the dog is barking, and then eventually the dog learns to like not come to come towards that part of the house. Um, we, had, we had in our real estate section we always have noise questions. And oh, real estate, I don't write real estate cuting, yeah. but we had a real estate question about barking dogs, and the comments, there were like a thousand comments, I mean, those <laughs> kinds of things, like yeah. thousands, thousands of comments, right. and it's a, it's a really tough problem, I mean, people are allowed and entitled to have yeah. dogs, yeah. and dogs bark, and the barking can drive you crazy, right. and yet again, that's the reality, I don't know what the solution is to that. Yep, yep. Right. And I mean, that happens here in New York City, you know, a lot of times we'll see real estate listings and we'll see things like, sorry, no dogs. You know, the building mm-hmm. doesn't allow dogs. Yeah. Or the landlord doesn't allow dogs. They say, sorry, no dogs. Right. It's like, why is sorry part of this? You know, the building doesn't allow dogs. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. It's okay to have a building that doesn't allow dogs. You have to be sorry about it. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. It's a- building is, is, is a huge, huge issue and it's, it's unsolvable and a lot of cases, I yeah. think. Yeah, it's a human thing. Human canine thing now. Cool. Well, um, yeah, well, thanks again, Joyce. I'll, I, yeah, I don't want to take too much more of your time, but uh, I think, yeah, this is super helpful and will be super interesting for people to listen to. Any any other any other gossip before we go? <laughs> um, not that I can think of. Yeah. I mean, there's, you know, the, the origin was that the Chinese government had this thing called network, which was sort of before Facebook, and mm-hmm. there was some discussion of misophonia on there, but that's basically been eclipsed by newer technology, right. you know, Facebook, Reddit, and stuff like that, Instagram, and, and so nobody posts there anymore, so all the confusion is no longer, you know, it's sort of like, that's obsolete, like the hypercuses network is obsolete, yeah. or message forums are obsolete, right. and then, well, here, here's the thing. One of the subjects I think is most interesting is whether people are reluctant to have kids because they don't want to have yeah. to their kids. Yeah, that, that that topic, the kids does does come up. It's like if they have kids, it's like, well, when are they going to start triggering me, or am I going to pass it on to them? That's that's another common question um, because we don't know like how hereditary is it. Sometimes it's not, and so, and yeah, and then should I even have kids? Um, yeah, that's that's an interesting to ex- thing to explore. Well, anyway, this has this has been really interesting. Um, and um, you know, keep me posted if you have anything to ask. Yeah. Or tell me or or you know, you can let me know when it goes live, or I can check and see, and maybe <laughs> maybe I'll listen to myself if I can stand it. I will let you know when it when it goes live, and uh, yeah, let's let's keep in touch. And um, other than that, have a have a great 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 weekend. Yeah, yeah. You know how to reach me. Yes, I do. I do. Okay, great. Thanks a million. Yeah, thank you. Have a good one. Bye. Yeah, you too. Bye.